Welcome to the premiere episode of Winning Healthcare Food Fights. I hope you join me, Hunter Schultz, each week as we bring more clarity and understanding to health and wellness without the mess. Today, I'm honored to have as my first guest, one of my terrific medical mentors. He's a quasi-retired internist, professor of medicine and public policy, and he was the chief executive officer of the University of Maryland Medical Center. He graduated from Yale Medical School where he did his internal medicine residency. He's board certified in internal medicine, medical oncology, and infectious diseases, and author of six books, including one of my favorites, Fixing the Primary Care Crisis. His latest, Longevity Decoded, The Seven Keys to Healthy Aging, is another gem. And I'm hitting 60 next month, so I'm kind of riveted on that subject. With a career spanning over 50 years, he is a real healthcare expert as defined by having an MD after his name. Welcome, Dr. Stephen Schimpf. Well, thank you, Hunter. Great, great to be here. So quasi-retired physician, it kind of reminds me of there, there are no retired Marines. <laughs> so <laughs> yeah, you really don't, like with, 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 uh, with physicians' great sense of purpose to help others, you really it's really tough to retire completely, isn't it? Well, it is. So I, I use the term, I used to say retired, and my daughter said, no, Dad, you're, you're, you're too busy. How can you be retired? So I, I, she said, try quasi-retired. And what it means to me is I, uh, I'm really very busy, but I don't have an honest job, so I'm not earning any money. But anyway, I, I am very busy. <laughs> <laughs> so, Steve, what motivated you to become a physician? That's a really good question, and it's got some parts to it. Um, I think it was kind of always in the background of my life somehow, and probably because my maternal grandfather was an old country physician. He died before I was born, but my mother would tell me these stories of going with him on a, in a horse and buggy as he made house calls, and, uh, and later in a Model T. And so I had these stories of, of this 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 guy who was really, really loved by his patients and his community. And somehow, so that was appealing and, and appealing, of course, because he was doing something of, of value to the community. And, and she told me stories of how uh, he would go and deliver a baby and um, they would pull out some money from under the mattress, literally, and hand it to him. Other times he'd, he'd, he'd do something and they'd say, well, we'll take care of you later and come fall. Uh, there would be a bushel of apples or a bushel of potatoes on the back stoop. Um, you know, it's a different, it's different than what we think of today in medicine, for sure. Mm -hmm. But anyway, so that was in the background. I think that I never really thought that I could do that. Um, that was, you know, um, that, that was something that I really couldn't aspire to. But sometime in my second year of high school, I took, I took an exam of some kind or another. And it, and it wasn't really an aptitude test, I guess. But anyway, it popped up that there were a couple of areas of career that I ought to consider. And one was medicine. And as soon as I saw that, I said, okay, I know. That's it. It's in the genes. <laughs> so that was it. <laughs> so it was, it, was, it was sort of that was your, your epiphany that took the test, said medicine. There you go. Yeah. Wow. And, you know, once I, once I knew... I had the capabilities to do it. I said, oh, really? Okay, I, that's what I want to do. There you go. And so it, I, I, it was settled for me from that moment on. Interesting. The, as I've read your books, including the, the latest is Longevity Decoded, right? Yes. Okay. Well, the first one I read was Fixing the Primary Care Crisis, which was a game changer for me. And one key theme on this show is how vital primary care is, and the other is how little people understand its attributes. And yeah. both are aspects, both are aspects I learned from your book, and it refined my healthcare thinking. So whenever I hear or read a healthcare story, I ask, where is primary care? And you know, I've, I recall the, the story of, it wasn't that long ago, there's a young woman sitting in church and her, her Apple watch went off saying you need to get to, a, to a, a, the hospital. Something was going on with her heart rate. And her mom was an RN and took her pulse and said, yeah, this is not right. They went to the urgent care. And then the urgent care said, no, you need to go to the ER. And, that's, and as soon as I heard that, read the story, 
I said, Where, where's the primary care physician in all yeah. this? And so one, that's, that's been a real help to me and I hope to others now that, that whenever they read these stories, asking where is primary care in this story? What's missing? It's like Sherlock Holmes, Sir Arthur Conan Doyle, the dog that wasn't barking at midnight and shouldn't have been. So as you say, there's a crisis in primary care. So what does that mean to you? So the, the, the simplistic answer is that physicians who are primary care physicians are retiring early or going to work for the local hospital or for the local insurance company uh, because their, their, their work in their private practice isn't, isn't working for them anymore, if you will. Medical students aren't entering primary care, and so we have a shortage now, and it's only going to get a heck of a lot worse. So that, that's one aspect to it. I think the bigger aspect, the more important one is, and you said it before, uh, most people don't appreciate the value of primary care. And part of that's because their primary care physician, if they have one, isn't giving them the level of care they need, that they deserve. And frankly, the, the doc, more often than not, is aware of it and wishes there was more time and was able to do more, but simply can't because of the, the, the lousy business system. Hmm. So what, what happened to get us into this situation? It, there's a lot of steps in there. But if you go back in time, when various insurances first came about, including Medicare and including uh, commercial insurance, uh, through your employer, primary care was not included. You paid for that yourself, and that was just an expectation. And then over time, um, I don't want to make it sound like I'm blaming the unions, but anyway, unions pressured for adding that in, and so it was, of course, for everybody. And uh, Medicare was pressured pretty heavily, so they added it in. Uh, so then Medicare, uh, sorry, then the insurance is paying for it, but insurers don't want to pay too much. Uh, they're in their own problems. Uh, they're trying to reduce costs. And so to them, how do you reduce costs? Well, one of the best ways to do it is to just say, I'm going to pay less. And so primary care gets the short end of the stick. The, the, the mm. insurance system is weighted toward folks who do a procedure, whether that's surgery or cardiology or gastroenterology or whatever. And it's weighted against the, the uh, physician who spends a lot of time with the patient doing, developing a long, a, a, you know, a very detailed history, understanding nuances and so on. So what's happened then is the, the physician has to see more and more patients in order to make things work out. I guess I should back up for a second. Um, how to say this fairly simply. Uh, so if you're earning less money from the insurer, but your costs have gone up. So why have costs gone up? Well, the costs have gone up because you need, a, you need to hire people to do the billing and coding. It's just not simple anymore. Mm. And, and every, every insurer has a different billing system. You have to have people who know each of the different insurers, and what they need, what they want, so it doesn't just keep bouncing back and forth. Well, that's one issue. It costs a lot more money now because of the, the billing process. Second thing is uh, the insurers, including Medicare, especially Medicare, put out all sorts of regulations and requirements that you have to follow. And this is another time sink. So there's two ways they're, they're taking time away and adding costs, while at the same time trying to hold down the revenue stream. So what's the doc going to do? Well, it's the old line of make it up with volume. You make it up with volume by seeing more patients per day. And how do you see more patients per day? Well, you can stop seeing your patient in the hospital, as has been the tradition for, you know, hundreds of years. You can stop going to the ER when your patient's in the ER. You don't have time for that anymore. So now you just save some time. Uh, it used to be the doctor would go to the hospital, you know, early in the morning and see patients and then get back and start office hours. Well, now, if you don't go to the hospital, you can start office hours a little earlier and you can get in a few more patients. 
But then the big thing is to reduce the time per patient. And if the doc's seeing, like, say, 24 patients a day, and let's assume an eight-hour day, that's three patients an hour, 20 minutes apiece. But there's other things the doc has to do. He has to answer the phone, has to you know, look at uh, reports and so on. And so you're really getting 15 minutes. But it's not all with you. You're probably getting 8 to 10 to maybe 12 minutes of what I'll call face time with the doc. And that's a pretty short time, certainly too short for comprehensive quality care when the patient has something more than let's just call it a simple issue. You just said something. Probably, that, probably a but, longer answer than you wanted. <laughs> no, no. I think it's important for people to understand something you, you just mentioned, and that is the comprehensiveness of primary care. I'm going to latch on to that in a, in, a, in a little bit. Okay. Um, Good. So That's it's, really important. Yeah. It's, it, I'll set it up by basically saying I, I see a lot of ignorance. And keep in mind that since I live in Panama and I have a whole bunch of expat friends from all over the world, so I get exposure to many different medical systems and perceptions of care. And I guarantee you the person who comes in from Spain has a completely different perception of care than a person from the US. And so you get you get expats arguing over what is great care. And they really aren't defining the care. So bottom line is in Spain, they have terrific primary care. In fact, they focused on it starting in 1986. So there's a lot of ignorance driving the perception that primary care is only for simple things. So what is primary care all about if it isn't for the simple stuff? Well, I guess we should say it is for the simple stuff, but that should be only a part of the show. So a primary care physician has been trained and has a fair amount of experience in dealing with these complex chronic uh, illnesses that um, are such a big problem uh, in our society today, things like diabetes, like obesity, like high blood pressure, like uh, like heart failure, um, um, uh, chronic lung disease. These are all diseases that the primary care doc can certainly take care of, but only if they have enough time. Um, and imagine the patient who is uh, maybe a little, this is going to take even another level here, a little bit older, may have some hearing issues, some vision issues, some mobility issues, maybe even some cognition issues. And let's add on that they got a couple or three chronic diseases. And let's add on that they're taking four or five or six uh, prescription medications. And now that patient comes into the doc with a, with a new issue. You can't deal with that in 10 or 12 minutes. You just can't. So, um, so you can't. It's a real problem. Uh, and, oh, and the other thing that I should add in, too, most, not most, maybe 40% of medical issues are driven by anxiety. And if that's the case, you can't deal with that with a quick, you know, pat on the back, you know, here's a new pill for you. Uh, it, it takes time and, 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 and effort and careful listening. And again, you can't do careful listening in just a few minutes. You lose the relationship too. I mean, there's there's no time oh to my develop. Oh gosh, yes, yes. You know, a big part of medicine, good medicine, is that interpersonal relationship between doctor and patient, or maybe I should say between patient and doctor. Um, it, it, it's absolutely crucial, and it's it's crucial one because it's important in order in order to elicit information from the patient, they have to feel that they can trust you. And trust comes with time and with energy and with, uh, uh, again, a sense that we're working together and not just going in quickly saying something and, you know, getting sent out uh, for a bunch of tests or sent out to the specialist. And I really should stop at that point and talk about that. If the primary care doctor doesn't have time to dig into a problem, what's going to happen? They're going to say, you know, 
let's send you off to the cardiologist or send you off to the gastroenterologist or send you off to the pulmonary doc or whatever, when if they had the time, again, it's all about time, they could perfectly adequately take care of the problem. So the issue, more than anything else, is get some time between doctor and patient. If you as a primary care doctor have more time with the patient, time to really uh, do what Dr. William Osler said, you know, the good doctor treats the disease, the, the great doctor treats the patient with the disease. You You're it. really dealing with the psychological factor and enabling them to get better, uh, easier, but you're also reducing the need to spend, to send people to a specialist in the first place or second place, because well, that's right. the primary care physician has time to deal with things and primary care covers all the, the, the systems in the body. So they have a broad view. Well, that's a, that's a I think, very important point. So you send the patient to the cardiologist, and the cardiologist, uh, no matter how good they are, they're going to focus primarily on cardiology uh, and the gastroenterologist on gastroenterology. Can I tell you a quick story? Mm-hmm. Sure. So what actually got me started uh, researching the issues, of, I'm, I'm a sort of a sub-subspecialist in my uh, practice days, so why, why did I get into primary care? Uh, we were, my wife and I were having lunch with some friends, and uh, during the course of the, of the lunch, the lady says to me, um, do you know this neurologist? And I said, no, I don't. And, uh, but why do you ask? And she said, well, I, I need to go see him, and um, he, he, I, can't get it, I can't get to see him for about a month and a half. And I thought maybe if you knew him, you could get me an early appointment. I sort of chuckled to myself that she thought I could, but uh, that's another story. It was so, a compliment. Yeah, it was. <laughs> so I said, well, I couldn't resist it. So I said, so tell me what's going on. And she described this sensation that she had that it's hard to describe over the, over the, uh, over the radio here or the podcast, but uh, imagine uh, sort of like a little sensation that ran from uh, her shoulder right down the middle of her chest down into her abdomen. She said sometimes it felt like a sort of a vibration, sometimes kind of like a little bit of an electrical sensation. And um, it, it, it wasn't that bad, but it was annoying and, and, it, and it worried her, basically. So she, eventually, after a couple of weeks, she went to see the primary care doc who uh, spent the, you know, the, uh, the 10 minutes, did a, cardi uh, did a good exam and did an electrocardiogram, which everything was negative, and uh, said... Well, actually, this was the fork in the road, <laughs> but the time was up. So he, he the uh, primary care doc, took the fork to the right and said, you know, I know you're worried about your heart, so let's have you see the cardiologist. So off she goes to the cardiologist. Now she's anxious, though. You know, the doctor wants me to see the mm -hmm. cardiologist. Um, so I really must have a heart problem. So she goes to see the cardiologist who does the history, does an exam, and says, like, everything seems to be fine, and your EKG is fine. But, you know, just to be sure, let's do a, uh, a stress test and an echo. So a stress test. And you, you can watch the, the, the dollars going up here now. Uh, those mm -hmm. two tests are not cheap. Well, of course, they were negative. And so, and she, by the way, she was around 68 at the time, uh, but in good health, or she thought she was in good health. Um, so... Uh, I just lost my own track. So, oh, so he said, you know, I don't know what's causing this. He said, but it does kind of go into your abdomen area. Why don't we send you to the gastroenterologist? So she goes to see the gastroenterologist who does a zillion tests and can't find anything and says, but let's just do one more. Let's do a CAT scan of your abdomen. So the CAT scan of her abdomen gets done and it's perfectly normal except for one thing. In her uterus, there's a thing that's, a, oh, a half an inch round and looks like a cyst. And the radiologist reads it as looks like a cyst. But, you know, just to be cautious, he says, but I can't rule out cancer. You should go see a gynecologist. Oh, my. Now she's really anxious. So she goes to see the gynecologist who says, looks like a cyst to me. But, you know, just to be sure, why don't we cut it out? We can do it as an outpatient. You'll be fit as a fiddle in a couple of days. 
Well, now she's crawling the wall, and she has the procedure done, and it gets sent off to the pathologist to see what it is. And the pathologist is a little anxious about it, doesn't look quite right, right to him the, in the local community hospital. So he sends it off to the academic medical center a couple of you know, cities away. Well, now she is really getting anxious. Oh, my God. You had to be sent way out there to, you know, the, the big place. Um, so <laughs> it finally comes back as a cyst. And the gynecologist says, well, everything's fine. And she said, well, no, I still have the same sensation that goes down my chest. And the gynecologist says, well, you know what? I think, you know, it sort of sounds like a nerve thing. Let's send you to the neurologist. Hey, yeah, yeah. Yeah, 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 that's right. Now, so she does finally see the neurologist who says, he kind of chuckles under his breath and says, you know, first year of medical school, we learned that nerves in the chest run from the back, from the spine, between the ribs, not up and down. Um, I don't know what's causing the sensation, but it's not a nerve issue, not a problem. Um, so I think by that point, well, that was mostly paid for by her insurance, it was $18,000. $18,000. I happened to be having breakfast with a good friend who was a superb primary care physician um, shortly after that. And I said to him, I want to tell you a story. I'm only going to tell you the beginning of the story. I want you to tell me what you would have done if it was in your office. So I told just the beginning of the story. He looked at me with a big smile. He said, I bet she got a million dollar workup. I said, never mind. Just tell me what you would have done. <laughs> he said, well, I would have done the history and the exam, just like uh, you said. And I would have done electrocardiogram. And he said, of course, if she was my patient, I would know her. I would know her family. I would know a lot of things about her. And um, I would also know you know, already would know what her cholesterol level was, what her blood pressure had been over the years, and all those sorts of things. And he said, so I would have been quite comfortable saying to her, you don't have a serious issue here. What you have is you're one of these people who is very hypersensitive to body sensations. And I can tell you that it's not an issue, not a problem. And... Um, but let's have you, I want you to come back in a week, not because I'm concerned about the sensation, but because I think your body is trying to tell you something, um, underlying issue that needs to get worked on. Well, as soon as he said that, I understood it right away because knowing the family, I knew that there was an issue, which I won't go into here, but um, that was really gnawing at her, at her brain, if you will. And it really did need uh, a lot of help. But it was an emotional issue, not a medical issue. So he got it right off. So who was he? He was, uh, call it what you want, a concierge physician, somebody who has a limited number of patients, gives them all the time they need, and listens, develops trust, develops respect, and it's a nice two-way street. It's not. So that's my little. But that got me started on this. You know, what's wrong with primary care? And yeah. of course, that that leads to uh, polypharmacy. I mean, I see this on my Twitter feed about how oh, sure. doctors fired one one Twitter one tweet was I fired I fired seven or eight doctors this morning, and it was a patient <laughs> who had come in. And the primary care doctor was just taking it all in, had time, spent an hour or two with her and discovered that, you know, that she was going to multiple physicians and there was no one coordinating the care. And, yeah. and it's, it's my, my niece and I, and I kid, I kid my, my nephews and niece about their generation and perhaps, you know, the generation behind mine, they have something that I term instant itis. They're used to getting <laughs> Domino's pizza in 30 minutes. They're used to getting, you know, now they're getting their, their television on their phones. I mean, I have an iPhone. It's amazing what comes through it. Sure. So they get in, instant delivery and, and they get mad when things don't happen right now, including success. <laughs> if I'm not successful before 25, I am nothing. And, yeah. and that's ridiculous. It took Ray Kroc till he was 50 to get on board with McDonald's. So 
there's a, my, my niece uses an app and I told her, get rid of the app. And the app was to find a doctor with an open appointment slot that's nearby uh, as yeah. soon as possible. Yeah. And I understand that. I get it. Um, it's that, it's a generational thing. And that, and I suppose even people, you know, my age and older uh, are getting used to the idea of very fast service and especially in the U S so I said, well, how does that doctor know you? And, you know, she, she's getting it now, but it's a situation that they just don't, most people just don't know the importance of that relationship and having someone to provide the continuity of care and the focus of care. They've never had it. So they can't, they can't imagine it because they've never had it. They've been shipped out within 10 to 12 minutes or less. And they're frustrated. And if they went in with, let's say, something like um, some acid reflux, they were given a prescription for, an, uh, uh, you know, an acid blocker, and 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 sent home, um, which is fine. But if the little time had been spent, might have found out that, uh, you know, there was something that they were eating on a regular basis that they shouldn't be eating in their situation, and. You know, and a lot of things you know that might be on the, on the cause side, and on the treatment side, a lot of lifestyle changes could make a huge difference, like cutting back on coffee, cutting back on alcohol, uh, not going to bed until your dinner is digested, um, keeping the head of your bed elevated a little bit, so because they have to run uphill, it always runs downhill. You know, these are all simple things, but there's no time for that. So I'll just give you the prescription and. Sounds like I did pretty good medicine, but it's really not. You 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 put a band aid on, but you didn't get to the the real source. And didn't and get to the source. Yeah. It's is that functional medicine that you're describing there of getting to the. It, it, yes, it is. Um, and you know, it's it's funny that we have a new concept called functional medicine. I think it's the older concept mm -hmm. uh, of of just. You know, being a good doctor, being giving you know really comprehensive care, as opposed to, uh, and, and so much of medicine though is that way. Not just not just uh, primary care, but you know, in, in every specialty, it's uh, let's 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 treat the symptom, and that's okay. I mean, if you're hurt, you want to do something for the sure. pain, and you know, but uh, but why the pain, and what's what's the underlying basic problem here? I was chatting with my niece who's really done a great job in getting her, her health. She's getting healthy. She's getting in shape and she's doing great on that. And she's quite a, she's quite a young lady and I'm very proud of her. And I've, I sense in them that they don't have any cultural influences either. They don't have a cultural influence that shows them what great care is. And when you think about it, the only cultural influence they would have is probably on television, and it's probably, wait for it, a hospital ensemble show, ER, yes. yep. House, ER. yep. Grey's Anatomy. So mm -hmm. it sends the signal, well, all great health care is in the hospital. Yes, and, and with specialists. Yeah. And, and that's something that needs to change, that education. And that's, that's something that, that this show, the purpose of this show is talking to people like you and others who are out there trying to change this messaging. And there's a, there's a real frustration with healthcare, American healthcare. And I sense that from even here and, and seeing comments from uh, on, on blog posts and, and newspaper articles, uh, that frustration is, is is there are people just throwing up their arms and, and giving in to those who are proposing government handle it. And I get that. One of the things that I, I'm, I think it's important to point out, and I'm sure you, know, you would agree, before you start blaming doctors, look at the system they operate in or practice yeah. in and blame the system. Start there. So I think that's one thing. And I, I, I think that's a, an important element to any conversation about healthcare, but something else that uh, 
Elizabeth Warren released her Medicare for All plan last week, and I read it, and I was stuck by the focus on coverage. In fact, right. virtually the whole thing was on coverage. And as I've learned from you, and especially from you and others, uh, coverage doesn't equal care. Just because you no. have insurance doesn't mean you have great care. In fact, I joke with people and say, what if I can show you that pe some people with insurance don't have great care and people without insurance, but have a certain type of medical arrangement, have better care than the people with insurance. And they look at me, you know, kind of, huh? <laughs> so if you can forget the five trillion a year for a moment, uh, this just smacks of throwing good money after bad. There's no focus on getting the care right first. That's time right. with the patients. So without going into the political aspects, we are, what about your thoughts on, on Medicare for all? Well, let's just stay with it. You're stay away from Medicare for all for a second, but just the concept of what the politicians have did with the, with the Obamacare so was the same thing. They focused on, on coverage as though that's the whole thing. And, and the Medicare for all presumes that, since Medicare tends to cost less, it has less administrative costs than commercial insurance, it also pays less, so it costs less. Uh, the assumption then is that if everybody got a Medicare equivalent, then uh, you know that would keep costs down, and everybody would have would have access to a doctor. But if you have uh, an insurance policy that doesn't pay. Uh, you don't have access, hmm. and it's kind of as simple as that. Well, you have access, but you're going to get the sorts of care we were just been talking about. You're going to get quick um, care that isn't the best care. Now, that the way I said that sort of implies, well, gee, then you have to spend more money. And the answer is, no, you don't. And I guess I'm kind of skipping ahead here, but if you don't mind, let me just do this. Mm -hmm. um, you don't. You need to, we need to spend more money on primary care so that we can give people uh, the type of care we've been talking about, the type of attention, the, 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 of the visit as long as necessary, access to the doctor readily, um, uh, being able to come in to see the doctor today or certainly tomorrow. All those things, um, that's going to cost more than 8 to 12 minutes for sure. On, on a per person uh, basis. But the other side of it is, it's gonna reduce those, those specialty care visits, it's gonna reduce ER visits, it's gonna reduce hospitalizations, it's gonna reduce prescriptions, it's gonna reduce um, uh, uh, blood tests and x-rays and so on. And that brings down the total cost of care much more than, um, than the increase in primary care. So it's, it's an incredibly uh, valuable trade-off uh, in, in what gets spent for what, but the more important side of it is, is it, it means really good care, real mm -hmm. care. And to fix primary care, I know uh, you, you, you and I both agree on, on a, the solution. You feature it in your book, and, and of course I've, I'm featuring it in mine. Uh, direct primary care is a solution. And uh, can you take a moment to explain it? Yeah. Uh, I should say that first, that there's a lot of different terms. There's direct primary care, there's membership, there's retainer-based, there's concierge. And they're all, there's some differences, but they all have a certain basic concept, which is give more time to the patient. So if the average primary care physician today has between 2,500 and 3,000 patients, and is seeing, say, 24 to 30 patients a day. The concept is, let's reduce the number of patients somewhere in the neighborhood of 500, maybe up, maybe a little higher, 600, 700, even 800, uh, and, and give them the time they need. So you're going to pay for that, of course. You know, if you're, you've got to, you have to pay the physician. I'm, I'm making an assumption the doctor should get as much paid tomorrow as they are today. So that means you're going to have to pay more per patient if you're taking 500 patients and giving them the care that 2,500 were getting before. But what do you get? You get 
uh, if I can call to doc today and I can get in today or certainly tomorrow, I can use email and get a response. I have the doc's personal cell phone number and I can call it 24-7. Uh, what else? Uh, some, not all, but some uh, direct primary care docs will actually go out and buy wholesale generic drugs and then sell them back to the patient at either no no markup or, you know, a, a trivial markup, uh, and that can save a person a ton of money. Mm. Uh, what else? Um, well, as I say, it means a lot less trips to the ER because you can call your doctor. You can call your doctor and say, this is what's going on. The doctor knows you. Actually, I'll give you an example. Uh, a person I know has had diverticulitis a couple of years ago, and uh, she has a doctor who isn't quite the same as DPC, but it's you pay per visit, um, uh, a fixed thing, and he has limited number of patients. Mm -hmm. So instead of paying, and I didn't get into this, so I skipped that. Anyway, so she calls the doc, and the doc's not there. She doesn't have his, she doesn't have his cell phone. Um, and, of course, you know, it's after hours. So she goes to the emergency room. And they say, well, it looks like it's, uh, she thought she had appendicitis. They said, now we think it's diverticulitis, but we'll need to do a CAT scan to, to be sure. But you're a woman, and so you need to have a pregnancy test done first. And she said, no, she said, I'm not pregnant. I'm not getting pregnant. I can assure you that. No, 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 you have to have the pregnancy test. Can't do the x-ray otherwise. So that, of course, takes an hour and a half to get the result back. And then if she gets the CAT scan, and yes, she has diverticulitis. She gets put on antibiotics, she's put on a clear diet, she goes home. Okay, so far, so good. About a year and a half later, flare up again. This time she calls the doc, and she gets his partner, who does not know her, and uh, he says, well, listen, I don't know you, so I want you to go to the emergency room. So she has to go back to the emergency room. Now, back to my physician that I told you about before, I asked him what he would have done in that situation. He said, well, I would have known the patient. They had diverticulitis once before. I would say to them, uh, here's a prescription. I'll call the prescription for antibiotics into the pharmacy. Here's what I want you to do as far as food and so on. And by the way, if you don't feel better by tomorrow morning, you call me. In fact, call me no matter what. First thing when you wake up tomorrow morning. And if anything happens during the course of the night, you've got my cell phone, call me. That's better medicine. <laughs> Instead, she went back to the ER and went through the whole process again. Nice. And you know, in the end, they said, take some antibiotics and clear mm -hmm. fluids. Um, that's not good medicine. Yeah, that's not it. And, and it's costing an enormous amount of money. Oh my gosh, she sent me the bill. I asked if I could see the bill. It was outrageous. It was like $7,000. The CAT scan itself was $3,000. Now, you know you can go down to the corner and get a CAT scan for 500 or less, but because it was in the ER and there was no choices, you know, no competition, it was $3,500. Goodness. You know, beyond belief. I've... I welcome the the, tw the tweets that I see from direct primary care doctors who who talk about how they save their patients. One one I recall that was pretty epic. They were looking the patient was looking at something like a seven thousand dollar bill for a thirty day prescription, and the the direct primary care doctor got it for her for twenty dollars, twenty three. Yeah. I mean, it, it, hello. It's not it, one one doctor that I follow. He's he's very fond of saying it's it's not the 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 cost of healthcare. It's the charges. <laughs> yeah. How true. Right. Well, you you know I, I I ran some numbers, and I think it's worthy of comparison to to five trillion a year. And I wrote them down. The average direct primary care membership is seventy seven dollars a month. That's $924 yearly, and that's for care. That isn't just coverage. That's for that's care. care. Yep. That's the kind of care that some of these doctors even do house calls, and I'm not thinking about right. you know calling the house. They actually go to the house. Mm -hmm. Some of them actually, that's all they do. Uh, Dr. Margaret, Marguerite Duan, near, near you, she does total house calls. That's all she does, and the patients love it. 
So yeah. if you look at, if you, if you have great comprehensive primary care for 329 million Americans, that's 304 billion with a B per year. I mean, and, and we're going to spend how much? Now, granted, you know, tack on another trillion and a half for um, prescri some prescriptions, m chronic care, but, you know, we could be dramatically cutting and, and spending a lot less and getting demonstrably better care. So, Steve, change my mind. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I want to just add on another point here, too that some of your listeners may say, oh, come on, these guys are just, you know, blowing smoke. No, we're not. Uh, it really does reduce the total cost of care dramatically. And it reduces it by what you said a few minutes ago. Uh, it means less visits to specialists, which also means less anxiety for you as a patient, and le less running around. It means less, less testing, um, less ER visits, You've got better health so you don't end up in the hospital. Uh, all around, the costs come down. But it does cost for primary care. And the problem then is, who pays for primary care? Well, you do because insurance generally won't do it. And that's a huge problem. And back to Elizabeth Warren right now, uh, Medicare does not pay for direct primary care. They'd save a ton of money if they did. But they can't figure that out, uh, and and because it's just the nature of government or or insurance in general, they have to be involved in everything, and uh, that's you know just doesn't work with direct primary care. One of the one of the observations I've seen is that uh, direct primary care enables doctors to think about your care when you're not sitting in front of them. So we have a far more complex, and if you, you know, I can, I can, you're a perfect person to comment on how much primary care, but medicine in general has changed just in the last 20 years, let alone the last 10. It's, it, it used to be kind of a one size fits all, but now it's dialed into the individual. In fact, I think you were the one who mentioned to me about gut microbiome, and I went, "Ooh, yeah. okay." So maybe a little, a little chat about how medicine is changing and is actually making government unable to deal with care. I'm not talking about coverage, but I'm talking about the care itself. It's just making them unable, and and by design, I I would add. From your perspective, how much has medicine changed just in the last 20, let alone the last, you know, 30 years? Well, technology is certainly part of it. I mean, you think of things like pacemakers and, um, uh, and, and, and new drugs that are available now that weren't available before. There's just so, and, and, and the things that we're holding on, that I'm holding on to right now, a smartphone. Um, you know, there's so much on that phone. Uh, for me, as, 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 as not practicing medicine, but I have a, an internal medicine textbook on the phone. I've got uh, all sorts of stuff on this phone that took up a whole shelf in, in my office before. So what's available to me, and not so much to me, but every physician out there, is access to a lot of help. Uh, they can be very valuable very quickly. So those are just a few of the things that, that have changed. Um, uh, look, think of think of surgery. Surgery has changed dramatically. Well, this goes back more than 20 years, but with the less invasive surgery, uh, laparoscopic type surgery, that's a huge change. Uh, gets people out of the hospital much faster. Uh, a lot of it can be done as an outpatient instead of an inpatient. And that's another whole issue is just is, so much more can be done outside the hospital that in the past had to be done inside the hospital. Mm -hmm. So those are just a few things. Yeah. Technology is, is and, and it's just getting faster. It's getting blazingly quick. I mean, the amount of, the amount of tests that you can order as a physician now versus, you know, 20 years ago 
And then it's, but it's also the time that you have as a physician or a direct primary care doctor would have to sit, come in in the morning and think about the, the, the chronic care patients first, and then looking at the, the next group over, which are less, uh, less needy, if you will. And, but they can put on their medical Sherlock Holmes hats. And yes, you think. just said something that's really important. It's thinking. And physicians need, like I've said a couple of times, they need time to think of a good history. They also need time to think. And thinking <laughs> makes all the difference. Um, if you don't have time to think, you make these quick decisions. If you don't have time to think, you send them off to the specialist. If you do have time to think, you can give really good care. It's an incredible. It's an incredible. But but direct primary care because you're pl- you're paying a monthly fee. It's not per, you know per second you're sitting in front of the physician. No. You're paying that monthly fee, which enables. I mean, I've I've asked this question and no one's come up with a with an alternative answer. But no one has come up with the answer to how does a physician in the old system or the current system how do they bill for that time. <laughs> Is there a CPT code for thinking time? To no, my there knowledge, isn't. There isn't. No. And, and if you go back in time, I was talking to a primary care doc while I was getting prepared to, to write fixing the primary care crisis. This is a guy who'd been in practice 35 years or so. He said, you know, when I first got started, uh, most people didn't have insurance that paid for primary care. He says, so I billed them what I thought was fair, and they were happily, they were happy to pay me. He said, then insurance came along, and he said, I, I billed, again, for what I thought was fair, and they paid me. He said, but not anymore. Uh, he said, I have to fill out all this stuff. Uh, they pay me less than I think I'm worth, and on and on and on. So, you know, it's, it's, it's just so different. Yeah. Well, you wrote Fixing the Primary Care Crisis in 2015, and title of the book, it was a crisis then. So what signs should we look for that would make you describe it as a catastrophe? <laughs> I think it is a catastrophe. And I think it's a catastrophe in part because of what you said before. I don't want to pick on Elizabeth Warren and Medicare for all, but they're looking at their own stuff. And there's going to be a lot of energy. Uh, it doesn't matter which side you're on, but there's going to be a lot of energy in the whole issue of of coverage without paying attention to care. And I think that's such an important thing. Uh, The politicians uh, don't understand care, so they're not paying attention to it. I think that's that's, that's one of the catastrophes. The other catastrophe, of course, is just where we are. People aren't getting the care that they should get, that they could get, that they deserve to get, and which doesn't cost that much. I try explaining to people, friends, for instance, is that primary care covers virtually all of your care. All of my care is primary care every year so far, knock on wood. Uh, I've never been in the hospital as an inpatient. So I, you know, again, I'm trying to lead a healthy lifestyle, but uh, I pay $40 a month for primary, direct primary care here in Panama. Now it's, it's a different system down here, but Forty dollars a month for a person my age is a bargain. It certainly is. And, and catastrophic, a catastrophic care policy is a hundred and well, well, next month it'll be one hundred and twenty-seven dollars a month with wow. a twenty-five twenty-five hundred dollar deductible per year. That's incredible. Yeah. So it gives you an idea, and you start adding in all that. Um, I mean, you start doing the math, and all of a sudden. Why are we spending all? Why are we spending all this money? We don't need to do that, and we'd have better care. We'd have less exa- anxiety. So you bet. It it goes into the the fud factor: fear, uncertainty, and doubt, stress. <laughs> you bet. And, you know, and, you touched on something that I just would like to make a quick comment about, and that's coordination of care. Sometimes you do need to go see the specialist, mm-hmm. maybe even more than one specialist, and that care needs to get be coordinated. Somebody has to be the quarterback, if you will. Mm-hmm. And that should be the primary care doc. Today, that's just not the case. But I'll just give you my own example. Uh, I 
get intermittent atrial fibrillation, and my doc has been perfectly capable of taking care of it. But it was coming on a little bit more often, and he said, you know, I'd just like to have you see the cardiologist one time and see what he thinks. So I said, okay, fine. So he said, uh, 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 hang on, I'll call him. So he didn't give me the phone number and say, here, you make your own appointment. Because if I had, it would have been six weeks off probably. So he called up and he said to his friend, the cardiologist, listen, I got a patient here. His name is Steve Schimpf, and he's got X, Y, Z, and I wonder if you could get him in in the next few days. Um, a little bit of a pause, and the answer is, how about Tuesday at 3? <laughs> you know, it makes a difference because that cardiologist knows that he gets all of his business, pretty much all of it, from primary care docs, including this one. And so if his if his primary care friend calls up and says, would you get my patient in soon? He'll do it because he wants to keep getting patients in. <laughs> it, it's simple. Right. Um, but the other example here where I live, this lovely lady who was having some, some neurologic issues and she went to the primary care physician who gave her the usual little bit of time and just didn't seem to understand that there was a real problem here. And we could all see it day, almost day by day getting worse and worse. So she goes back again. And now she's really sick, and they say, oh, yeah, you should see a neurologist. Here's a list of neurologists with phone numbers. We like this one. It was right across the street, by the way. Mm. And so she calls and is told literally uh, a month and a half before oh. you can get in. I said to her, you know, I got to get involved here. I said, listen, I'll call a neurologist. I'll get, I'll find one who will see you right away. She said, no, 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 it's okay. It's okay. Well, she keeps getting worse and worse. Finally, does go see the neurologist who says, oh my gosh, uh, you have, it doesn't matter what it was, but it was an issue that needed a neurosurgeon. And here's the name of the neurosurgeon, the same old story. He oh, can boy. see you in August. This was in, you know, April. So, um, Someone else who lives here was on the board of that hospital where that guy works. Called that, called the hospital CEO and said, "Can you get your guy to see this patient?" <laughs> <laughs> it shouldn't be that way. It shouldn't be that way. So if the primary care doc here had called and said, "Listen, I got a patient here. I'm really concerned about. Can you get her in?" Of course. And if the neurologist had called the neurosurgeon, who gets all this business from neurologists. Mm -hmm. He would have seen her right away. <laughs> yeah, you don't have to play where there's a will, there's a relative. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So here's, I, I read Longevity Decoded, and I, I enjoyed that one immensely too. And, Thank you. And, um, but a lot of people will, I mean, I'm, I'm, as I said, I'm 59, going on 60. And so health and wellness thinking, it's playing a bigger role in my life. And... I know we, we as individuals can extend our lifespans beyond the average, but one of the things that uh, longevity decoded isn't really just for older people like me. What about younger readers? What are they going to gain from it? Uh, I think I need to give you two sentences to put into context, and then I'll answer your question. Okay. And the point of it is that we start to lose, starting in our 20s, we start to age. And we lose about 1% of every organ and every body function each year. A 1% we don't notice. And next year is one more percent we don't notice. It get to be my age, which is 77, um, you notice it. I know my, I don't have the same muscle mass I used to have. I don't have the same balance I used to have. My vision's not as good. My hearing's not as good, and so on and so forth. If you get started early in life, you can slow that down, that 1%. We're all going to die. We're all going to get older. Uh, but you can slow that process down. If instead of 1%, maybe you can get it down to three-quarters of a percent, or even not, probably not much less, better than that. You say, well, that's not a lot. Well, it is. That's a 25% reduction in the rate of decline. And so if you start young, uh, you'll slow that whole process down. 
and it will compound over time just like saving money for your retirement. So I think the compounding concept is really important here. Hmm. And so and so what's it all do? It, it's all about lifestyles. It's about what we eat, how we move, cold exercise, uh, dealing with our stresses, being sure we get enough sleep, staying away from any kind of substance abuse like um, like tobacco or drugs or too much alcohol, um, uh, challenging our brain all the time, intellectual challenges, and staying connected with other people. We need as human social engagement. So if we just, it's not all that hard, uh, but it's best to get started early. However, if you're 59 and want to get started at 59, that's good too. Uh, because it doesn't matter when you start. Maybe you're maybe you're 77. You want to start at 77. That's okay too. Uh, the important thing is to get started. Yes, as as Kermit the Frog once said, "There's nothing to it but to do it." <laughs> uh, you got it. <laughs> and Kermit Kermit's very wise. I also think what you've been what you've been talking about primary care obviously fits within that. A doctor needs to be the one that's coordinating what you're doing and figuring out, okay, yeah, what based on your gut microbiome, your genome, uh, the personalization of care, these are the things that you, you should be concentrating on to, to maximize how long you live free from disease as much as possible, which is what most people want. There's something Absolutely. Else something else that I wanted to bring up in your background, and that was the infectious diseases. Yeah. And so you studied infectious disease transmission or pandemics. What was, what was that about? Not so much pand uh, Most, well, I, I did a broad overall training, but most of my work was with patients who had uh, cancer, especially those with acute leukemia. And they are a very high risk of infections that frankly uh, are, are are, are, are mortal. And so the agenda was, how do you treat these really rapidly and preferably how do you even prevent them? And so that's what my, uh, my mm. early work was all about. Ah, okay. I was thinking that uh, I, I have a friend of mine here who used to run Panama's. He was, he was basically in charge of the Ministry of Health's program for dealing with the migrants coming in, especially during the, the Ebola situation. Yes. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, sadly enough, a lot of these migrants are coming through and they'd be, arrive in Panama. And if they'd ha if they had been exposed to Ebola in Africa, they'd be arriving just as it starts to, uh, yes. they become, and it's 23 years, 20, 23 days, something like that. And it got me to thinking a little bit about pandemics and direct primary care and the fact that direct primary care enables you to enable someone to stay at home and, and be in, in essence quarantined and yes. preventing and let's them. Just, let's, let's explain why, because the doctor right now gets paid to see you in the office, mm -hmm. but doesn't get paid for talking to you on the phone or over the, you know, over Skype or, you know, whatever. It doesn't get paid for e uh, for uh, for emailing back and forth. But yeah, you can be taken care of at home for a lot of things. And with the direct primary care model, the doc's getting paid either way, it doesn't matter. And it's the service and it's, if need be, you know, what I love are the, are the, the, the medical equipment, like just a simple pulse oximeter. They're $26 now for a very, you know, good unit with pulse as well as uh, the blood oxygen level. And for you, that gives you a lot of, of, of good information along with temperature and, and perhaps blood pressure uh, sure. at home. And this is less than what, a hundred dollars easily. Yeah. Yeah. And it's, it, you know, and that information can be easy, readily trans transmitted to the doc. Uh, you don't have to come in to get your blood pressure taken or come in to get your pulse taken, or come in to get your temperature taken. Just send it in. Send it in and... and For that matter, you know, you can have your weight checked and, uh, on a scale that sends it in or your blood sugar checked in a, on a, in a system that, you know, just sends it right in. Mm -hmm. And if, when I go back and think about pandemics, I think about Bill, you know, paging Bill Gates. You were wondering how to... <laughs> 
how to reduce the effect of a pandemic, well, you ought to be looking at, at uh, direct primary care. Well, Steve, as, as we wrap this up, what would you like our listeners to know? I guess I would say to you, um, you could ask me this question. Um, okay, you've talked about direct primary care. Uh, what about you? Did you spend your money on it? And the answer is yes. My wife and I both have a, a direct primary care doc. Uh, we are both very pleased with them, and we get the type of care we've been talking to you about. And I really believe that it is the right way to go, the right way for the future. We see, we get great care, and it makes a difference. You feel more confident. I mean, you... you, uh, you I'm very confident that it's, 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 it's wonderful care. <laughs> it's, yeah, it's wonderful care, but it, it gives you more peace of mind that, you know, the bases are covered. I would, I mean, oh, yeah. It does for me. Yeah, it, it, it does. Now, it turns out that a year and a half ago, uh, we'd both gotten the flu shot, but we both got the flu. We woke up at 6 o'clock in the morning. We knew what we had. Hmm. We waited until about 6.30 or 7 and texted our... Um, our respective uh, primary care docs. And by 10 o'clock, we were taking our first dose of uh, uh, the antiviral. Hmm. That's good care. And as you said, we, we didn't have to go in. They said, don't come in. <laughs> we don't want right. to see you. <laughs> Just tell me what's going on. And, you know, that was that. That's something else that, again, I always go back with, as I learned from your book, the direct primary care, that basically the how important it is in terms of preventing the spread of a virus, whether it's the flu or Ebola or whatever, uh, having people at home, not going into a hospital, that's something I learned from an emergency physician. The thing they fear the most is someone coming through with uh, the Spanish flu. Another outbreak of that was, was sure. devastating for healthcare. Uh, killed a lot of doctors and nurses. And again, paging Bill Gates, this is a good solution to be looking at. Well, Steve, thanks again for, for joining me. And in the show notes, show notes, I'll have links to your books and, and your video series too. Thank That's you great. again. Thanks. Thank you You're again. Well. And I hope we can touch base uh, sometime in the future and, and catch up on things and perhaps see where we're at uh, for the, uh, the new system, whatever our politicians come up with. <laughs> I look forward to uh, getting together with you again, irrespective of what system they come up with. Yes, I will be looking forward to hearing your thoughts on whatever uh, the different proposals are. So again, thank you, and, and we'll talk soon. Okay, great. Thank you. Thanks for listening to the Winning Healthcare Food Fight Show. Hit the subscribe button to hear more expert thinking on getting better care without the mess.